What could turn a soccer star teen into a convicted killer? How could two boys who were adopted into a life of religious virtue end up with lives shattered beyond repair? Today's story explores the life-altering consequences of childhood trauma and forces us to confront the complexities that fester within adopted families. It's a story filled with twist, heartbreak and crucial lessons about the importance of early intervention for children living in the shadows of emotional and physical abuse. Lawrence Joseph Larry Schwartz Yulsilton was born on the 25th of August 1966 to parents who were not equipped emotionally or financially to take care of him. His birth mother was a drifter and his father was a pimp and both were just teenagers when Larry arrived into their world. His first few months of life were tumultuous to say the least. Just before he was two years old, his parents abandoned him in an apartment complex in Silver Springs, Maryland. He was discovered in squalid conditions, dirty and hungry and handed over into the care of the foster system. This should have signalled a new start for Larry. The foster care system is intended to act as a safety net for vulnerable children, a sanctuary where they can be placed into homes that offer love, attention and security they desperately need. But for Larry and so many other children, the system became more of a revolving door of disappointment and neglect. He was shuffled between multiple foster homes, with each one falling remarkably short of providing him with the basic emotional and psychological support that every child deserves, especially those coming from traumatic backgrounds. In some homes, he was met with indifference, just another mouth to feed. In others, he faced physical and emotional which only compounded the distress he had already experienced in his short life. For the next six years, Larry was shuffled between at least four foster homes, with each serving up some variation of poor treatment he had become so accustomed to. And then when Larry was seven years old, he finally found what he had been searching for all along, a forever home. Enter his saviours, Robert and Catherine Swartz. The couple were a pillar of their community in Broadneck, Annapolis. Robert was a successful computer technician, while Catherine was a high school English teacher. The couple were devout Catholics and they dreamed of having a family of their own, but they were unable to conceive and after much soul searching, they decided to pursue their dreams in a different way. They believed that opening their home to children from troubled background was a way of sharing their love and faith in a way that really made a difference. But the difference they made would have tragic consequences. When Larry came to live with the Schwartz family, he was quickly joined by two other adopted children. Michael was six months older than Larry and he too had spent years being passed between foster homes. Then there was 10-year-old Anne Lee, whom Robert and Catherine had adopted from Korea. All three children were incredibly close, but none more so than Larry was to his little sister he called Annie. Friends would later share that when Annie first arrived, she would not sleep in a bed because she was used to a simple mat on the floor so Larry would sleep on a mat next to her so she wouldn't be lonely. He was often seen walking down the road, holding Annie's hand, playing the role of protective big brother perfectly. Larry had finally found the family he had dreamed of. In fact, it was better than he could ever have imagined. He had his own big brother to look up to and a little sister to defend. Finally, it seemed like Larry had overcome his challenging start in life. By the time he was a teenager, Larry had grown into a handsome young man who was well liked by his classmates. He never spoke badly about anyone and didn't let on too much about his past or home life. While he wasn't the best student academically, he was a gifted soccer player with high hopes for his future. His adoptive parents had similar big dreams for Larry and they made sure he was clear about their expectations. They intended for Larry to enroll in the seminary and train to become a priest so that he could continue their legacy of giving back. To everyone observing the arrangement, it was clear that the children were well cared for and had everything they needed to succeed. But looks can be deceiving. It was only after the events on the 17th of January 1984 
that the truth about the life of the Schwartz home came to light. That morning, 911 operators received a call from a man who reported that his parents were dead. He gave his home address as 1242 Mount Pleasant Drive in Cape St. Clair, which is six miles northeast of Annapolis. In a matter of minutes, police arrived at a chillingly horrific crime scene. Catherine's nude body was outside in the snow. She had been stabbed in the neck as well as bludgeoned to death with a wood-splitting axe. The scene inside the house was no better. Robert was found in the downstairs den. He had been stabbed to death with a steak knife. Larry had been the one to make the 911 call and he was immediately taken to the station for questioning. So how did we arrive at this point? How could two parents who appear to be so devoted to their faith and family end up victims of such a violent act, seemingly at the hands of one of their own adopted children? To answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning of his story. Larry had been adopted when he was seven years old, but his troubling behaviour stretched back much further. From around age three, he had exhibited difficulty regulating his emotions and lived in constant fear of being abandoned. He would get out of the bed at all hours of the day and night to go into the bedroom of whoever was responsible for him at the time to make sure they were still there and hadn't left him behind. He would sneak around the house and pull food out of the garbage cans as if he were worried there wouldn't be enough food for him. Given what we know about Larry's life before entering the foster system, it's easy to see the link to his behaviour as a toddler. But to understand why those experiences shaped his conduct as an adult, we first have to understand what was happening inside his brain at the time. The development of a child's brain during the first three years is nothing short of remarkable. It lays the groundwork for virtually all aspects of a person's future, their emotional, behavioural and cognitive maturity. During these early years, the brain forms neural connection at an astonishing rate, which is far faster than at any other point in life. This period is crucial for developing key emotional and behavioural skills like attachment, trust, empathy and impulse control. At the same time, the brain is also particularly vulnerable to adverse experiences like trauma and neglect. Traumatic events can disrupt the architect of the brain itself. These alterations in the brain can lead to issues with stress responses and increase the likelihood of emotional and behavioural issues later on in life. They also increase the risk for mental health disorders, difficulty in forming healthy relationships and even increase the chances of developing a chronic illness. All of this means that the first three years of a child's life are like a window into the trajectory of their emotional and behavioural future. When those years are filled with love, security and stability, the child will develop resilience to deal with life's challenges. But when these years are filled with neglect, poverty and the child is more likely to become a person in a constant state of fight or flight without the tools to deal with these emotions. That's exactly what happened to Larry. There was a small window of opportunity for Robert and Catherine to help Larry turn his dysfunctional childhood around, but instead they only compounded it. It turned out that Robert and Catherine were more than just devout about their Catholic faith. They were zealous. Everything that happened in their home was strictly controlled and managed through the lens of their religion. Robert was known to picket at a local abortion clinic every Saturday morning, while Catherine was extremely strict about the children's education. The couple ran marriage encounter sessions where they advised struggling spouses that divorce was against God's rules, no matter the circumstances. And instead of offering their three children unconditional love, acceptance and support, they constantly berated and criticised them for every one of their perceived shortcomings. If the children disobeyed their parents, they would be locked out of the house and forced to spend the day on the front porch in the snow. Larry's older brother Michael was a gifted musician and Robert would refuse to allow him access to the piano when he wasn't living up to their standards. It seems that Larry was also a constant disappointment to his parents. Thanks to a learning disability, which was only diagnosed when Larry was an adult, he struggled to achieve much more than C's in his classes. As a result, his parents repeatedly belittled him in front of his siblings for being so stupid. Robert and Catherine wanted Larry to become a priest, and when he was 15 years old, they sent him to seminary school in Pennsylvania. But he didn't pass those classes either, and returned home within a few months. 
The strictness just didn't apply to the children's schooling. Robert and Catherine made the boys get a part-time job and give their earnings to them, but they weren't allowed to have driver's license, so they had to hitchhike to and from work. They weren't allowed girlfriends or any friends unless they were known through the church. The rules were so strict that Mike was kicked out and cut off from the family because he missed a curfew. This incident was a devastating blow to Larry, and not just because he was so close to his big brother. Remember, abandonment was a trigger for Larry, and it had been since he was deserted as a toddler. All of these factors made life inside the Schwartz home a power keg of unresolved tension and resentment. It was as if Robert and Catherine's parenting journey was built on a shaky foundation of good intentions, but implemented in such a way that love and condition was based on performance and obedience. For Larry, this environment didn't provide the stability he needed. Rather, it accelerated his downward spiral, pushing him towards a breaking point that would have dire consequences for the entire family. On the 16th of January, 1984, the tension inside the home reached a boiling point. That day, Larry had two tests at school, and when he came home, his mother asked how they had gone. He had actually done well on one test, but he didn't think he had done well on the other, which he self-consciously admitted to his mother. She responded, Oh Larry, knowing you, you probably failed them both. You'll probably fail them all. That moment triggered a flashback of a conversation he had heard between Catherine and Robert a few nights earlier. They were discussing a plan to send him away, just like they had done to Michael. In that moment, he realised he was about to be abandoned, again. He would later describe that feeling as, it felt like a balloon was being pumped up that just happened to burst on that night. Larry walked upstairs to his bedroom and took a swig from the rum bottle he had kept hidden in his sock drawer. Then he calmly returned downstairs and stabbed his parents to death. The following morning, Larry called 911 to report that his parents were dead. His voice was so calm that the operators initially suspected the call might be a hoax, but they sent officers just in case it was legit. They arrived at the address minutes later to find Larry standing outside the front of his house holding his sister Amy. The calmness of Larry's demeanour was a direct contrast to the bloody scene around them. After discovering the two brutalised bodies, the home was cordoned off and a thorough scene investigation began. Forensic technicians moved through the home, collecting and documenting all evidence which might point to whoever had carried out such a horrific attack. On the way, they made several crucial discoveries. Pressed into the snow next to Catherine's body was a detailed footprint. That footprint matched a pair of deck shoes which were also covered in blood. The shoes belonged to Larry. They found wet jeans and a grey sweatshirt marked Broadneck inside the washing machine. These items matched the size of clothing that Larry was known to wear. There was also a bloody handprint found on the sliding door leading from the den outside to the pool area. This handprint was later matched to Larry. Even before the prints came back as a match, it seemed pretty clear who the perpetrator was. Larry hadn't realised that Annie had seen some of the attack from her bedroom window the night before. At some point after the attack, Annie had gone to Larry and said she was scared. He told her she was having a bad dream and to go back to sleep. Annie told the officers that during the night, she had seen a boy dressed in jeans and a hoodie standing over her mother's body in the snow. The person she described matched the description of her big brother. When Larry was questioned about the violent double murder of his adoptive parents, he denied any involvement and instead pointed the finger at his older brother, Michael. The lie was easily exposed when the police database showed that Michael was in custody a few counties away at the time of the murder. Finally, after plenty of encouragement, Larry described exactly what had happened that night in explicit detail. There was a wood splitting mall there. She was sitting and watching TV with her blue pyjamas on. I got the mall, hit her right in the back of the head and dropped the mall. She was still sitting there. There was a little table in front of the TV with some silverware and a steak knife on it. She was breathing sharply. I could hear that real loud. I didn't care anymore about anything in the world. I picked up the steak knife, stabbed her and got her around the neck. When I saw her blood, I felt like, good in a sense, because I finally did something about them yelling at me. 
I didn't feel good because I don't like blood. I had blood on my hands. Not much. I started growling like a dog. Then I saw my father standing there. He was in his computer room in the basement. He was stunned. I was standing right in front of him with a knife in my right hand. I stabbed him in the chest around his heart. He screamed and fell back in his room and shut the door. I pushed the door open. He was still standing up. I stabbed him twice and shut the door. Then I came to my mind and said, Oh God, oh God, oh God, about 20 times. Then I thought I wanted to get rid of everything, not to be caught. I took my mother's wrist, dragged her out of the room into the snow, took her clothes off because I wanted to get rid of fingerprints on her clothes. I bent over and fingered her twice. I took the knife and the maul and threw them away. Larry told the investigators that he felt like he was watching the murders as they happened rather than having done them himself and he went into great detail about what life was like inside the Schwartz home. Whilst the confession cleared up who was responsible for the murders, the motive needed to be thoroughly investigated to ensure the charges laid against Larry were appropriate. It's not up to officers to take a suspect's word at face value, and they needed evidence to back up his claim. So they looked deeper into Larry's medical records and spoke to friends of the family to see if there were any truth to his justifications. This turned up hospital records which documented that Larry had been taken to the emergency room 10 times in the past six years. Each time the injuries he presented were explained away as typical childhood injuries like minor abrasions, bruises and broken bones. It seems that not only were Robert and Catherine psychologically in their children, there was also aspects of physical in their punishments as well. Officers also spoke to Michael, who corroborated Larry's experiences at the hands of their adoptive parents. All of this information went some way to explaining how a deeply troubled child had become a young man capable of committing such a horrifying act. While Larry's life experiences don't excuse his actions, they go some way to explaining them. Ultimately, Larry was offered a plea deal for the murders. In exchange for pleading guilty to second-degree murder, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, with eight of them suspended. Initially, the sentence was served in a facility which provided him with psychiatric therapy and social work support. During his incarceration, Larry was diagnosed with a learning disorder. With the right support, he was able to complete his high school education as well as two years of college. In 1993, after serving nine years of his sentence, he was released on parole. In 1990, Larry's older adopted brother, Michael David Schwartz, was arrested for the stabbing death of a 57-year-old man in Annapolis. For his crime, he was sentenced to life in prison. It was a cruel irony that two troubled children were adopted into what was thought to be a loving and devout home, only for both to end up involved in violent crimes that led to life-altering circumstances. Larry eventually moved to Lake County, Florida to start the third chapter of his life. He met and married a woman and the couple went on to have one child. They lived in a working class neighbourhood and they had average jobs and spent their weekends socialising and spending time together. Finally, it seemed that Larry had found the peace and normality that had eluded him his entire life. But tragically, this chapter in Larry's life was to be the shortest of all. On the 29th of December, 2004, he died from a heart attack at age 38. His death came nearly 21 years after the murder of his adoptive parents. Larry's life was later immortalised into a made-for-TV movie and book. Ultimately, the story of Larry Schwartz and his family offers some insight into the intersections between trauma and mental health, as well as the complexities of family dynamics. It highlights the need for understanding and compassionate intervention in the lives of children who have suffered early hardship to give them the start in life that they desperately require and deserve. If you found yourself gripped by this case and you're as eager as I am to dig deeper into others, there's a simple way to make sure you're in the loop for future episodes. Just hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. This way, you'll be amongst the first to join us on our next journey into the criminal mind.